and we're continuing on chapter five of the Oversoul 7 series. We're on the first book, The Education of Oversoul 7. Oversoul's, Oversoul 7's mini vacation. Oversoul 7 kept making platforms to hold himself above the well of Ma'a's experience, only to topple into it again. His apparentness from her was slipping. In those moments of his own lucidity, he thought that this wasn't fair at all. Cypress was going too far. This part of the examination was too difficult for his stage of development. He'd fail miserably if he didn't end up losing himself in Ma'a completely, if that was possible. The only time he managed to reassert himself was when he was called unconsciously or unconsciously by one of his other personalities or when Ma'a needed him in some direct manner. For example, he was lost within Ma'a or thought he was when suddenly he was aware of Proteus's descent to Earth. Quick, clear images came to him from Proteus. Quick and clear images came to him as Proteus landed. Once he saw the entire landscape from the trip of one of Proteus' skis, what on earth was he up to, Seven wondered irritably, and what was happening to Yosef and Lydia while he was trapped? What else could you call it? Inside Ma'a's body. Ma'a, it seemed, needed his help at every turn. When he was Ma'a losing his independence, that he... Then he felt her own fear and insecurity unmitigated without the benefit of his own superior knowledge, and her fear threatened to devour him. He had to get her above it. He realized suddenly only her release would free them both. Actually, she was pretty aggressive and independent on her own, except when her fear made her forget everything she knew, as it had yesterday. Was it yesterday? When they'd been found, the man who captured them were different in appearance from any people that Ma'a or Rampa had ever seen, and it was this that frightened them so completely. Ma'a cried out as they were led down the hall beneath torches that were set in the wall's niches. She and Rampa were terrified of fire. Seven discovered both of them cowered at the fire itself and at the dark shadows that leaped up the rocky gray walls. The captors, their captors or rescuers, were approximately nine feet tall as Lydia would have measured them to Ma'a's five foot three and Rampa's five eight. Beside this, the men wore robes dyed with brilliant cover, colors and obviously not made of hides. Seven knew that he had some information concerning these people, but Ma'a's emotions kept blocking out his own awareness. In the cave now, Ma'a stared at the wall. She and Rampa were chattering, wondering whether or when they would be freed. They'd just finished eating the last of the roots they gathered and tied about their waists. A torch burned high above them. The top of the room was open in the center. The two of them were less frightened now. They'd been left alone for hours. The cave's door refused to budge, but otherwise they were not restrained in any way. Oversoul Seven let his own consciousness climb again wearily. He peered through Ma'a's eyes, but as he did so, images appeared on the cave wall. They were apparent to him, but not to Ma'a, who paid no attention. Briefly, he thought that this was strange since they were, after all, her eyes he was looking through. The pictures were milky and opaque at first, then they turned clear, soft, vivid. To Seven, but not to Ma'a, the wall disappeared as if it did not exist. Mentally, no one in particular, Lydia, had just called for help. The trailer wall was blurring before her eyes, and she knew what that meant. It was one of those trailer camper trucks Lawrence was driving. She'd been reading the small table that was hinged to the half wall behind the driver's seat. One slim bony hand rested on the book. Now it trembled suddenly without warning. Another petite stroke. Quickly, she leaned back while she still could 
anchoring herself so that she wouldn't fall off the chair and she wouldn't call Lawrence. She determined not to let him drive on unknowingly, unknowing. The edges of her vision were blurring faster now. Something within her was giving way. She braced herself for the confusion, maybe for unconsciousness. Lawrence would have the guts. Would Lawrence have the guts to take her pills? You promised, she thought wildly. I won't die senile in a home locked up. Her eyes flew to the small cabinet where the pills were kept. If she didn't come out of it, right if her mind was gone if she couldn't keep up lawrence knew what to do looking at the cabinet was the last thing she remembered as usual when she came out of it she didn't know what had happened lawrence was still driving and listening to the radio then she hadn't called out or he hadn't heard if she had the book was still beside her she felt dizzy that was all she but who was she Panic splashed over the frightened surfaces of her mind. How could she forget? How could the body forget its name? The body's name. Did the body have a name? Oh, Lord, she closed her eyes, feeling as if tiny islands of knowledge were crumbling away, falling into endless oceans of oblivion. So quickly that he had hardly realized what he was doing. Oversoul 7 leapt from Ma'a. Uh, to Lydia's body without knowing finesse. He quickened her blood, thinned it, gave orders to the body consciousness to increase circulation, filled in with the commands necessary. Count, Lydia, remember. Remember, count, he directed. He suddenly recalled a trick that sometimes worked. Quickly, she found the name of the first number one. She saw in her mind and concentrated on it visually. Then two, then three, continuing in order until finally the panic cleared and her own name, Lydia, floated back to her between 15 and 16. Oversoul 7 returned again without knowing how he did so to Ma'a. He thought triumphantly he wasn't trapped inside Ma'a for good. Then he'd left, if only momentarily, Still, his distance from his personalities was vanishing. He must have agreed. No experience was ever thrust upon a soul, or a personality for that matter. But when he had agreed? And what else had he agreed to? Seven felt petulant. Already Ma'a was getting restless again. What was she so upset for? Lydia could have lost her life right then, and he knew she wasn't ready. The thought intrigued him. If she wasn't ready, she wouldn't lose it, of course. Actually, Lydia was thinking the same thing. Here she was. The attack was over. She was alive, as far as she could tell. She was still sane enough. She forced herself to concentrate on Lawrence and away from herself. How close he was, yet how far away. She watched the back of his head. Like a big bleached walnut, she thought the brown white hair so alive, bristly, the cords on the back of his neck so responsive. Oh, the ease which with the neck shifted as he watched the road. You're awfully quiet back there, Lawrence called cheerfully. Am I? Her first spoken words after the attack were so bright, her voice so crystal clear and lovely, the sane and sane and normal that she wanted to shout out with joy. Oh God, how great life consciousness was. It's such a great day, a shame to read and not pay attention, she said. So I've been looking out the window. We'll stop for supper, he said. Mm. She opened her pocketbook and looked into the compact mirror. Her face was intact. How odd, the eyes flecked with orange looked clear alert knowing sardonic knowing sardonic as usual the face wasn't even terribly wrinkled for 73 she was too thin to get wrinkled she supposed the mouth small drawn at the corners now though the thick white bubble of hair still vigorous yet what happened in those what three minutes not enough blood to the brain as the doctor described it and unnoticed 
the small cells die. One by one, blinking off, taking memory and desire with them, what events had disappeared that she would no longer recall, what fine discriminations necessary to, organi to ordinary life had vanished. So how many did you have to lose before it showed? Pity the poor body, the poor mind, so thoughtlessly losing its precious cargo. Shit, she snapped to herself. That kind of thinking was worse than, well, maybe even a stroke itself. It bled the will dry, live in the moment she looked out, filling her mind with the view. It was autumn. Why had fall always made her feel exhilarated? Yet it did. They passed brown gray lawns and others that were deep in orange fallen leaves, and soon they were driving through a small town. There were all the houses, she thought, and each was secret and mysterious, containing within dimensions of human experience that could never be put into words. Would words finally desert her too? They would, she supposed. Yet here she was, 73, traveling through these towns and villages in this today. Suddenly she left. All at once it seemed that the houses and trees were all artificial in some way. She couldn't put her finger on that the leaves would somehow be recycled and used again. And no one would know the difference except maybe a very few children, perhaps. Yet a great nostalgia filled her at the same time, as if the whole town had already gone beyond recall, or as if she had left in some way she couldn't understand. Simultaneously, a sheer rush of love for the real physical world filled her. This was a real earth. After all, she was still in it, still rational and alive in it. She felt exultant. These lovely Ohio towns, she said, it's Proteus's memory of Ohio, of the Ohio block in its artificial foliage that just struck Lydia in bleed through fashion, and it's Proteus's fresh astonishment with the natural earth that's reviving her spirits now. Cypress said to Oversoul 7, Proteus in the 23rd century is erecting his living nodule at the same time that Lydia and Lawrence hook up their small tent to the camper in the 20th century. Do you understand? There are points of association brought into activity, Seven blinked. This conversation with Cypress had obviously been going on for some time, and he had only now became, become aware of it. Of course, it's obvious, he said, desperately trying to cover up. But you so often overlook the details, Cypress said. When you help one person, when you help one personality, you help all others. Unconsciously, each feels the effects. For matter, each personality helps the other. And when you're in contact with one, you're also in communication with each of them. But who helps me? Seven asked petulantly. I've been pelted around like a volleyball. A most apt earth description, Cypress said, smiling. But what makes you think you haven't been helped? How long have we been talking like this? Seven asked, ignoring the question. In whose terms? In any terms, Seven said. You're just dancing rings around me, and you think it's funny. Ma and Lydia are in real trouble, and maybe Proteus. Who knows? And I get stuck inside Ma, just trapped there except for now and only let out when somebody needs me. It's not at all fair, examination or not. You make your own reality, Cypress reminded him gently. We all do. Each consciousness does. So, dear Seven, try to remember what you've forgotten, or better still, just take it for granted that you really know what you're doing and go on from there. Take what for granted, Seven asked. There you go again, your predicament. Ma in Ma's in a predicament, and Lydia in Proteus, I'm not except for the ridic this ridiculous examination. Cyprus could no longer contain, contain her amusement. She sighed. Oh, Seven, 
you'll have to get back to Maha for a while outside of your present context of operations. I'm sure you'll agree with me. You still don't understand. But I want to know what's happening to Yosef, Seven objected, and I don't want to go back inside Ma'a. You have no idea how terribly confining that is, and I keep getting lost in her till I think I'll never get out. Couldn't we take a break, a recess, and look in on Yosef? Oversoul Seven had adapted the 14-year-old image again. He found it most effective in dealing with Cyprus. She smiled and said, All right, but remember, this is to be a very brief vacation, thinking of Yosef's painting. The landscape of the farm and grounds was on the easel. Yosef was in the process of applying a series of transparent glazes to it. Bianca, the 18-year-old Hosenstaff daughter, sat on the messed-up bed watching as he saw her seven moaned. Yosef was obviously showing off, standing with stronger thighs apart, leaning backward, staring at the painting with his heavy brows lowered dramatically, and very conscious of Bianca's admiring glances. You better be out of here, he said. If anyone catches you in my room, I'll really be thrown out on my ear or ass. She blushed, stood up, and wiggled over to him teasingly. She hadn't retired her bodice so that, looking down, Yosef saw her bare breasts. She grinned shamelessly. He thought, flipped one breast out of the bodice and him, and ran laughing about the room. They'll hear you. Hush, shut up, he yelled. They aren't home yet, and you know it. Worry, she giggled breathlessly, her brown eyes alight with excitement. Well, you're the youngest, br well, your youngest brother is. You can't bribe him to leave us alone forever. What if he tells? La, la, that's your concern, she laughed. I'll just lie about the whole thing. Well, so will I. So will I, he shouted. He never knew how to handle her when she got in this kind of mood, and she knew it. Ah, the hell with it, he yelled. Hopelessly, she grabbed her, threw her on the bed, and grinned while she ripped his clothes off again. Seven was very quiet. He and Cypress had merged with the landscape painting, peering through it, out into the bedroom. Well, he's certainly having a good time, Seven said finally. I thought that's why you liked him so much, because he did enjoy himself, Cypress answered. Well, he is, isn't he? There's something in all of this that I don't like, Seven said doubtfully. In the meantime, he's, he and Cypress discreetly blocked out the scene so as not to invade Yosef's privacy in such a personal moment. They simply stayed at the landscape while putting a mental shield between themselves and the room. When Seven peeked back out, the girl was gone. A disheveled Yosef sat unhappily on the bed, muttering to himself. He'd lost most of the, the good daylight painting hours, and now he was so disgusted with himself that he didn't like the working. And if he didn't work, he'd just feel worse. More as he eyed the painting, he had the the uneasy suspicion that something was wrong. For one thing, the glazes didn't look nearly as clear and glowing as they could. There was a suggestion of murkiness creeping into the color. He went over to the easel and stood glowering at the painting. Three days ago, the painting had looked great to him. This morning, it had looked great. Now he had projected all of his dissatisfaction with himself into the landscape. Flaws he hadn't noticed earlier became readily apparent. He had grayed his colors down had he grayed his colors down too much? He had put on the top glaze before the one beneath was dry? Or was the problem in the dry pigment itself as he mixed it with the oil? He almost snarled. The thing was ruined, ruined beyond repair. His great inspiration, the best in his life, and he'd messed it up to hell with it. He'd never be a good painter, to hell with Bianca and her damned family. 
and the three lousy meals a day they gave him. He even had to eat with the farmhands. It was Bianca's fault for tempting him to begin with, keeping his mind from his work. In a rage, he shouted and kicked the bedside chair across the room. Then, to Oversoul Seven utter then to Oversoul Seven's utter disbelief, he grabbed the landscape and sent it flying to the floor with sudden fury. At first, Seven thought the landscape had come to life in some mysterious fashion. When he saw before him, what he saw before him was a landscape but different, a three-dimensional one that stretched all around him. He looked around, trying to get his bearings. Cyprus and Yosef were gone. He and Ma'a, he was with, he was Ma'a again. She stood gripping Rampa's hand. Before them were acres of green trees and flowing bushes, such as they'd never seen before. The entire area was ringed by immense sheer cliffs, obviously impossible to climb. They were in a secret valley. A group of robed people stood in a circle on a small grassy knoll, and yet Ma and Rampa were being led toward them. Seven felt himself falling headlong into Ma's experience again, yet oddly enough, descending into the body almost seemed like coming home. That's the end of chapter five. That's it for today.